Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. So last time, we built up an expression for our scattering density, n of r, assuming something infinitely periodic. But we didn't really cover how to solve for the Fourier coefficients. So today, the goal is to dive into one method for solving for these coefficients, and thus finally being able to develop an expression for the intensity we've been promising you for a while now. As a reminder, we are evoking constructive interference only when delta k is equal to g. Otherwise, this whole integral drops to zero. When that condition is satisfied, you get an expression that looks like so, where the intensity at a particular hkl is proportional to the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient at that same hkl. So to get to intensity, we first have to solve for our Fourier coefficients. Because we built n of r as a Fourier series, we can solve for the Fourier coefficients, n sub g, by taking the inverse transform. And we can do this because we don't have any absolute squared funny business like we do in the intensity equation. All the phase information of the original n of r is still maintained in the inverse transform. Since we're invoking an infinitely periodic crystal, there's some tricks we can play which make the math a bit easier. Instead of integrating over the whole volume, we're going to slap a 1 over the cell volume in front and integrate over just one unit cell. So now when we plug in our Fourier series representation of n of r and move some stuff around, we get the following expression. When integrated over the entire unit cell, there is only one non-zero solution, and that is at g equals g of the same hkl as the coefficient. We also saw this in the delta k equals g constructive interference condition from lecture. Now after some plug and chug, we can see that we can get n sub g sub hkl equals n sub g sub hkl. So mathematically, we're on the right track. But now let's look back at our original equation for n sub g sub hkl. This integral portion effectively represents the scattering density within one unit cell. And this is what we are going to call the structure factor. Yeah, and so to describe the scattering density within one unit cell, we'll first invoke that the atoms within the cell don't interact with each other and have their own local scattering density called n alpha as a function of r prime. Where r prime points from the atom to some position vector r. And like before, we can state that our total n of r is a sum of all of these n alphas over all the atoms in the unit cell. Let's first rewrite the structure factor equation. Now, let's put our new n of r back into this equation and effectively multiply by 1. Why would we want to do that? I know it's not inherently obvious, but what it allows us to do is separate the terms in the structure factor equation into two general categories. One, into terms that deal with the scattering from each atom, which we condense into one term called the atomic form factor, and two, this term here, that gives where the atom is located within the cell. To really show this technique, let's go through a couple of examples. Okay, so what would the structure factor look like in a simple cubic system? The basis for this case would just be one atom at r alpha equals 0, 0, 0. g sub hkl dot r alpha would always be 0, so the structure factor would be f naught for any hkl. So for every situation where delta k equals g, we have an intensity simply determined by the atomic form factor f naught. Okay, that's pretty simple. Let's do something a little trickier. Okay. So let's pick another cubic system. Let's take a look at cesium chloride. This time we have cesium atoms at r equals zero, 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 and a chlorine atom at r equals half, half, half. Like the simple cubic case, the cesium atom would result in a structure factor of f naught cesium for all HKL. Yeah, and so what will the second atom in the summation do? Well, in that case, g sub HKL dot r alpha gives the following. And from Euler, we know e to the minus i times pi times some odd integer equals minus 1, while e to the minus i times pi times some even integer equals 1. All right, cool. Let's put it all together. Okay, we're going to get a structure factor that goes as f naught cesium 
plus F naught chlorine for H plus K plus L equals an even integer, and F naught cesium minus F naught chlorine for H plus K plus L equals an odd integer. In the case where all the atoms are the same, we should see systematic absences in our reciprocal lattice as shown in this G3 equals half slice of a BCC cell. So thus based on a given structure and basis, we can predict the spacing and the relative magnitudes of the diffraction intensity. Sounds pretty awesome. Hold on. If I know where my atoms are in the first place, why am I bothering with a diffractometer? All right, I see you're paying attention. In practice, you don't know where your atoms are. Instead, you take a guess at what the structure is, then use the structure factor to calculate the intensity pattern, compare that to experimental data, and then tweak your guesses until they finally match. Okay, that makes sense. So to recap, we were able to solve for the Fourier coefficients at a particular HKL in terms of the scattering density within the cell. We called that term the structure factor and separated it into terms that described the scattering from each atom and terms that described the position of the atoms within the cell. All right, we'll be coming back to structure factor again next time when we look at centered cells in reciprocal space. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you then.